Hello. When you're new to photography, you can very easily be overwhelmed by the number of choices that you have in front of you. From buying a higher megapixel camera to buying something as simple as a UV filter, everyone seems to have an opinion on what your next purchase should be. And hey, I'm no different. But what I am hoping to do with this video is give you a few different items and things that I've bought that ultimately haven't really lived up to the expectations that I had for them. Little disclaimer for this video before we really get going. I don't think any of the products I'm about to talk about are actually bad in any way. I just think that they're not meant for everyone. And in the right circumstances, I could totally see myself recommending these to people. The point of this video is to encourage people to pause and really consider whether or not a purchase is going to improve their specific style of photography or not. This list is also going to be in order of least expensive to most expensive, and probably by proxy of that, least controversial to most controversial. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about today are actually these UV filters. Now, I was watching a video the other day by James Popsies where he was talking about how these can actually cause for worse image quality. Now it makes sense to me on paper, after all, if you take a cheaper piece of glass and you put it on a more expensive one, there's always the possibility that what you're going to be left with is a worse image, but I'm really curious to see if we can actually tell a difference here. I have one of these, just a little Tiffin filter, one just by a budget maker, and we're going to see what this actually looks like, if we can tell a difference. Okay, there we go. Actually. Before we head in, now might be a great time to talk about this second item that we have on this list, and that is expensive tripods. Like this one, the Manfrotto B-Free Aluminum. Now I watched a bunch of different videos when I got this that were all talking about how cool of a piece of gear it was. And you know, for the most part, they were right. It's light, it's well made, it comes with a cute bag. There's only one problem. In the three years that I have had this, I have used it once, for photography at least and that was to shoot a wedding. This mainly comes down to this not really flowing very well with my type of photography. I am not a landscape photographer, and I am certainly not the type who's gonna stay in the same place for long enough where having an extra piece of gear that needs extra setup and weight is not really worth it for me. So I really encourage you before buying a tripod, try and think of all the times that you would actually end up using one as you're taking photos. And if you decide that you do need one, do you really need one that's expensive like this? Or something like the Peak Design, which is $500 for the carbon fiber version, which is kind of insane? Or can you go with something a bit more modest? Because I certainly could have, but I guess I'll leave that up to you. So we're back inside where I don't feel weird about being loud. I've got the pictures on my iPad that we took outside and I want to see if anywhere we can tell that there's anything that's not quite the same. So after spending an unreasonable amount of time looking at both of these images side by side, I don't think I can tell a difference. At first I thought I could, but I don't think I can. I think it's just placebo. So I would at least say personally. I don't think they do any harm. While ultimately not terrible, I would still say you probably don't need these. Unless if you're going to be in an area where you know that for some reason rocks are actively flying at your camera and you want to protect your lens, you're probably better off just keeping your $10 instead of having these just be unnecessary baggage. Speaking of bags, the next item on this list has to be expensive luxury camera bags like this. The Ona Union Street. I will say, I love the look, the design, the feel, the materials. I love how this bag is on paper. On the back, it has this really nice magnet that keeps this back flap shut so you can put something in there without worrying about it flying out later. However, I think it's uncomfortable to wear. It is in practice, too big, too bulky. And because of that, I really don't end up using it that much. So despite having all of these pockets, having this extra build quality, if I'm not comfortable wearing it, I'm probably not going to take it many places. And ultimately, that's what I've found in the years that I've had this, is I very rarely use it. So that's why I call this a money sink, because despite everything lining up on paper for you really enjoying this product, you can still get it and find out that you don't like it and then you don't end up using it. 
Now, that's not to say that camera bags in general are a bad idea, because as silly as it might sound, having a nice camera bag, to me at least, makes me want to go out and take photos. It's almost like with AirPods, how the case matters just as much as the actual product. It's the home for your gear. After all, I love my smaller Ona bag, and I love my Billingham bag too. However, that is not to say whatsoever that to get a nice camera bag that you have to spend up the wazoo for it. Take this for example. This is the Tamrac Bushwick bag. I got this for $25, brand new from b &H. Now it was on sale, and I think that price has gone up, but if you are able to look around and find one of these for that price, it's amazing. It does not have the fanciness of the Ona bags, like the leather, stuff like that, but what it does have is the usability, including these same cool metal latches that the Ona bag does, giving you quick access to it, which I love. If you're new to photography, I would strongly encourage you to get something like this, a more modest camera bag, instead of one that costs three or four hundred dollars. Take that money that you would have spent and put that towards a new lens or a trip someplace to enjoy the gear that you already have, instead of putting it towards a luxury bag that you might not even end up liking like me. I don't have a good segue to this. 70 to 200. Let me tell you another story. This one not taking place years ago, but instead right now. I am planning a trip to Korea with my best friend Calvin. It's going to be a great time. And if you want to see that, maybe subscribe. I don't know. And on that trip, I'm taking my Sony a7 II as a backup camera. The problem is I'm trying to only bring one lens with me because I'd really like my entire bag not to be filled up with photography gear. And you'd think that that would be the perfect situation for a 70 to 200 like this. The problem is when it comes to the aperture. To be specific, this is my 70 to 200. It is a 70 to 200 F4 G OSS from Sony. This is a fantastic lens. Even with that slower aperture, you are getting very smooth, very nice looking background blur. You are getting incredibly sharp images as well. So what's the problem? Well, there wouldn't be one if it weren't for this, the 85mm f1.8. If this lens is sharp, then this lens is tack sharp. Even at f1.8, corner to corner, the image quality is amazing. And the thing is, something that I am really excited about with Korea is being able to take night photography, and undoubtedly, the 1.8 is going to do better. And this is the situation that I found myself in time and time again owning both of these lenses, where I'm second guessing myself which one is going to do better in a specific circumstance. I bought this lens so I wouldn't have to constantly be changing lenses, yet that's what I find myself in time and time again, constantly second guessing myself as to which one of these lenses is going to perform better. And that's when I realized that this did belong on this list. Is a 70 to 200 an amazing lens? Yes. Is it perfect for everyone? No. I didn't even mention that this lens is a thousand dollars more than this lens. You can of course get 70 to 200s that are faster than this, but with that you are also going to be paying much, much more, and that is just mitigating the problem. It is not going to completely wipe it away. If you disagree with me on this choice, then please leave something in the comments because I'm still on the fence with it myself and I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. There's something that I've realized recently when it comes to photography and I feel kind of silly that I haven't realized it until now. That is, this thing with gear never ends. There will always be another piece of gear. There will always be another lens. The search for the best gear ends the same way that a mobile game does. You finally climb to what you think is the peak of the mountain. You finally have what you need. You're finally happy with your gear. Just to find that as you cross that peak, you find you're not actually at the top. You can't even see the top. It might be a bit silly to compare buying gear to climbing a never-ending mountain, but at times that's certainly what it feels like. So before you buy that next piece of gear, I would really encourage you, think about it. Will it actually make you a better photographer? Will you be using that thing in a year? Or will it just sit on your shelf, waiting for when you might need it? Anyway, stay tuned for next week's video where I talk about the top five things that you need to buy as a photographer. <laughs> I might actually do that. I don't know. But yes, thank you for watching. 
God bless. Have a great day.